I shared last Wednesday night that uh, I've caught myself in a habit of asking you to turn with me in the Word of God. I'm not asking you this morning. My hope and my prayer is that you brought a copy of the Word of God with you, whether it be on your phone, your iPad, uh, written on your hearts, or, or you have a hard copy like me. We're in 1 Timothy this morning in chapter 4, so if you would turn there to 1 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy in chapter 6. How many of you have been keeping up with the Olympics? Wow. One or two, yeah, one or two. I told Sue, I said, you know what, I can't wait for the luge and the skeleton and the bobsled competition. Now, I'm not into figure skating. I'm not into ice dancing. Um, none of that stuff that makes you give, feel warm and willy all over. But in those speed and skills, and I understand that skating is a skill, the first time I ever went ice skating, anybody ever been ice skating? A few of you? I figured out right quick, Kirk, it's a lot different from roller skating. When I grew up, when we were kids, that's been a long time ago, by the way, the roller rink, the skating rink, was a place that uh, most of the kids hung out in the little town that I grew up in. I think I may have shared this with this congregation before. There were one of two places in town that you hung out, and if you weren't hanging out at one of those two places, you were cruising Sonic or the Pizza Hut. And, uh, you know... Back then, our vehicles got about five to six miles the gallon, but gas was about, what, 75 cents a gallon back then? And uh, so we, if we weren't either at the, the arcade downtown, we were at the skating rink, or we were cruising town. And in my case, it was a three-quarter ton pickup because I, you know, I was one of those country boys. But I remember going out to the skating rink, and I remember my mom teaching me how to roller skate. And I never could get, that, get, I never was that good, okay? <laughs> I never could get to that point that I could turn around and skate backwards. If I did, it was I strictly by accident. Strictly by accident. And so looking at ice skating, you know, I've tried, decided to try ice skating one time. And so, actually, I've been ice skating a couple of times. And uh, it's a lot different. It's a lot, lot different. But when the Winter Olympics come around, I love watching the bobsled and the luge and the skeleton. There's three different categories, and basically you're in a sled, and you're sliding down this hill at roughly anywhere from 70 to 90 miles an hour. That's right. They've introduced a, a, new, a new category this year, the monobob. And we watched it last night. It's where one person pushes a bobsled... And they hop in it, they act as both the, steer, the person steering and the brake man, all at the same time. And, and I love that. It's suspenseful. It's suspenseful because you never know at which turn what's going to happen. I mean, last night they were bumping the sides, and it almost looked like they were going to shoot out. And the uncertainty of it is what, it's kind of like you guys that are all wrapped up in uh, car racing. You know, I've, I've said that people only go to car races to, so they can watch the wrecks and see how bad it is. But it's suspenseful. I know that some of you are like me and you keep up with world events, the things that are unfolding before our very eyes. And the biggest news this last week, other, apart from the possibility of Russia invading Ukraine, the biggest news this last week was the inflation rate had grown at a, at a rate faster than what the government expected. It came out as of last Thursday, the inflation rate at the end of December was somewhere around 5%. It came out last Thursday at the inflation rate, they expected it to get to 7.3%. It actually exceeded that and it's now, as of Thursday, they estimate it 7.5% for the month of January. That's the highest it's been since 1982. Now, I want to tell you something. That is a sled that I, I, I'm not, I, I'm scared. I mean, I, 
Now, I know that the Bible says God's not given us over to a spirit of fear and a bondage, but of a sound mind and all that. And you know, I don't have a sound mind, so God hasn't given me that yet. But I know that the world that which, I heard an amen over there. The world in which we live is a world of uncertainty, and it's, it's suspenseful. And we don't know at which time that we might not make the next curve, and we might fly completely out of control. And so the world in which we live is scared. Many people are living in fear. But in 1 Timothy in chapter 6, I want to read one verse this morning. I've got up on the screen, or actually I would have up on the screen, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. But we're going to focus in on just a few verses. Verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain gain. Now there are three words and I hope this morning that you have put your spiritual thinking cap on. Take your dunce cap off Jack. Put your spiritual thinking cap on because we're going to study some Greek this morning, okay? And I know I don't speak very good English. How my my, uh, Greek is probably going to be atrocious, but I think that we need to understand the context, the proper context of the scripture. And one of the first words that I want us to look at is in verse 6 is that word godliness. That word godliness. The Greek word for godliness is Eusebia. And it's used 15 times. 15 times do we find that Greek word in the New Testament. 14 of which is translated in the English word godliness. One time is translated in the English word holiness. Now, we understand the basic definition of godliness is of or having like character to God. That's what godliness is. And if we look at its usage in the New Testament, we understand the attributes and the characteristics of godliness is holiness. And in the world of uncertainty in which we live, folks, we need to be practicing, and and I'm afraid that one of the church's misconceptions in these days or one of the church's failures in these days, is to understand the concept of what godly living is all about. And to understand the contentment and the gain that comes with it. The godly person wants nothing but simply what God has given. God doesn't promise us rainbows and roses. As a matter of fact, we find Jesus instructing his disciples and telling them that there would be something quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples, said, you'll be hated of all men's men's sake for, for my sake, for my name's sake. You'll be hated of all men. Jesus promised them that they would go out and they would be persecuted. He he told them that they would go into some places and they would be, uh, that they perhaps would even suffer death. And we know of all of the 12 of the apostles, those that followed Jesus, that almost all of them did suffer death for the sake of Christ. Those, did not su- those that did not suffer death for the sake of Christ, they were ex- John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. For instance, in other words, he was taken out of his homeland, away from his family, away from his friends, and put into the place that was to serve as his punishment. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 6, I want to read some verses to you. Excuse me, 2 Timothy in chapter 4. Paul says in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and at the time, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. You know, as we were watching the Monobob event on television last night, 
And as those, this was the women's monobob, by the way, and they would grab this bobsled by two D-rings on the back of that bobsled, and when the, at the appropriate time, they would take off in a full sprint, pushing that bobsled, and before they got to a certain point, they had to have jumped into that bobsled, tucked their arms in, taken control, and ducked their head, and tried to promote the best aerodynamics that they could. And from there on out, until they crossed the finish line, the race was on. I'm afraid that a lot of people believe that the Christian race is a sprint. That it's over just like this. And in terms of time and as far as God goes, it is over just like that. But let me tell you something. When it comes to godliness and Christian living, we must understand the race is not a sprint, but rather a marathon. When Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy in chapter 4 that he had fought a good fight, he'd finished the course, he had kept the faith, what Paul was telling Timothy, he says, for I'm now ready to be offered up. What Paul was telling Timothy, from the point of his conversion, he had been in a constant battle, in a constant turmoil, in a constant race for the cause of Christ. Now, I've spoken with pastors all over the state. Matter of fact, I got a text from a pastor this morning. I'd like to read it to you. I came in contact with this pastor back when the tornadoes hit all across the state of Arkansas and Kentucky and I'd made contact with this pastor because their church had been struck by the tornado and I was seeking an opportunity for us to minister to them. Now we haven't done anything with them but he has been sending me texts on a regular basis and this is what he said this morning. He said, we thank God for you and Oak Grove, praying for you as you lead in the name of Jesus. And then he quotes the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. And I don't know what translation this is, but it says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And he closes his text with this statement. The message of the gospel will change your eternal life, but will also change your everyday life. May our thoughts, words, and actions be for the sake of the gospel. The Apostle Paul understood that concept of marathon running. There was a young man, 17 years old last night, that competed for the United States of America in the 500 meter, they call it a sprint, speed skating. 17 years old. He's, my understanding is, if I understood the commentator last night, he has set the record in the United States for the 500-meter sprint. But that was just the beginning. You see his race that was coming up was the 1,000-meter sprint. You see, there was something, there's another event that's a little bit longer and so he couldn't spend himself. He couldn't spend himself and all of his energy in that shorter race because he knows the longer race is coming. Now, he did very well last night, I might say. Christians, as far as we go, and as far as the church goes, we've got to understand that there's a marathon to be run. And we can't focus on those situations and circumstances and cause us to derail. We can't look at all the uncertainty going on around us and live a life of fear 
Because the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. You know what Paul was quoting as he wrote to the young Timothy? It's almost identical to what Job wrote in Job in chapter 1 and verse 21. Job writes this. He says, And naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, the godly person acquires riches that he might take with him. Jesus warned them not to lay up their treasures on the earth where moth and rust cause it decay and where thieves break in and steal. But we're running that marathon race that's leading towards eternity. We're looking forward to that prize. We're pressing toward the mark. We're looking forward to the beginning of eternity because what it says in verse 7 of 1 Timothy, in chapter 6, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. None of the material things that we gain on this earth are worth missing eternity for. Adrian Rogers once said that, he had heard it said, that you never saw a U-Haul following a hearse. The reality of it is, folks, you never, you never, you've never seen gold and riches carried to the grave. Some have said, well, preacher, you know, there's a story of someone who was uh, going to be buried, and he was going to be buried in his Cadillac. You know what happened to that Cadillac if that was in fact true? That Cadillac, at the moment that it entered into the ground, began to decay and rust and rot. We must be Eusebia, godly, holy, living after the character of of God. The second word that I want to look at and want us to examine in this morning in 1 Timothy in chapter 6 is that word contentment. That word contentment. That word contentment comes from the Greek word autarkia. Or actually autarkia is the proper pronunciation the way I understand it. And literally what that word means is sufficiency. Sufficiency. Godliness, or Eusebia, with autarkia, contentment, is great gain. This word from the Greek only occurs in one other place in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 9 and verse 8. In, bo in both places it's literally rendered sufficiency sufficiency in or in both translations or in several translations it's rendered sufficiency the apostle paul understood what that sufficiency was about also in philippians in chapter 4 and verse 11 he writes these words to the church at philippi he says not that i speak not that i speak in respect of want for i have learned that what's in whatsoever state i'm in therewith to be Content. Now that word content and that word contentment are related. The word contentment is autarkeia. The word for content is arche or arkel. It's the same word that's found in the word, and literally what that word means, it it's means sufficient in or of itself. That word content in Philippians in chapter 4 and verse 11, it's the same word that we find in Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, I want you to look at that and, and I want you to consider this. If you understand what the Apostle Paul is saying in Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 5, then you understand when he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, you understand that, that that lifestyle of contentment or being content 
has found its source in him because he is the only thing that ever never leaves you nor forsakes you. In other words, he is eternal. He is eternally indwelling in the life of the believer. So literally, when we talk about contentment and being content, we look at this, the substantive word contentment and we see that it is the condition of the person who is content. In other words, contentment is an inner sufficiency. It's an inner sufficiency, Adrian Rogers says, that keeps us at peace despite our outward circumstances. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The third word I want us to consider this morning is that word gain. That word gain. The word gain in the Greek is horsmas. It's used only twice in the New Testament. It's used the first time in 1 Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 5. And we find it again, obviously, in verse 6. Some have defined it. Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionary defines it this way, a way or a means. A way or a means. In verse 5, it's put this way. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. From such withdraw thyself. Timothy, or Paul puts it this way in 1 Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 8. He says, and having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Let us therefore be content. You know, we find in the New Testament, Jesus instructing the disciples and telling them that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say that there was anything wrong with riches, but he, ultimately what the implication is, is that the man who focuses more on those things that are material rather than those things that are spiritual, he's going to miss the mark. He's going to miss the mark. Because it's all about what he's pressing toward. Is it, is it about the sprint or the marathon? Is it all about living in a life of uncertainty, placing your faith and trust in those things which ru rust and rot and decay, and those things where the thieves can break in and steal? Or is it about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? That's what Jesus said in Matthew in chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So when Jesus uses that example of between the camel and the needle and the rich man, his disciples look at him and said, well, who then can be saved? You see, their perception was, is that if you were blessed with riches, then certainly you were worthy to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What they fail to understand is, is that godliness and contentment sometimes and most of the time are contrary to the man who is pursuing riches on this earth. They're always contrary when his priorities are on those things and not on the kingdom of heaven. Remember I said that the Greek word for gain is porous moth. It's been defined as a way or a means. That word way and means in, in the English, especially in American English, the word way carries many definitions. There is, there is a, by definition, you could look at the word way and you could say, well, it's a path. You could also look at the word way and you, could, you can consider 
the word way, not just a path, but a means. And, and that's why the Strong's Greek and Hebrew Dictionary defines it that way. But in fact, in biblical terminology, way and means have two different, two different definitions. In terms of theology, we see that the means, the means is the method by which something is gained. The way is the pathway that you get there. In light of that, we understand that grace, as far as the gospel goes, grace is the means and Jesus is the way. Grace is the opportunity. Grace is, the is not the pathway, but grace is the way that God has provided for all men to come to salvation. But Jesus is the way to get there. He's the pathway. That's why Jesus said in John in chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that's the way. The means is how we get to the way, and that's the grace. Paul writes in Ephesians, it's for by, what? Come on, y'all know this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for by grace through faith. For by grace through faith. Grace is that unmerited favor that God has made the opportunity for you to experience. Faith speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the pathway that we come to salvation. We cannot enter into eternal life with, neither without grace nor without Jesus. You see, Jesus is the result of grace. He's the pathway in which God is provided. So we understand grace is the means, Jesus is the way. Looking back, what does 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 say? But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's because the Spirit of God has come to live within us that our contentment is found in Him. You know, see all sorts of people living these days, they're striving to get by, they're uh, trying to attain a higher goal, they're climbing the rung of the ladder of success, desiring to reach that next rung and, and thinking, you know what, if I can just get this or if I can just get that, then I will be satisfied. The problem is, is that they're never satisfied. Because many times, the way that they reach the next rung, or make the next step, or gain the next level, many times they do it without godliness in mind. Many times they look at that and they think, well, you know what? Who needs God? Much like the man that Jesus told the story of in the Bible when he looked at all that he had gained he thought to himself I need to build a bigger barn to which Jesus responded thou fool the Spirit of God responded to him thou fool the Heavenly Father responded to him and said thou fool For tonight, thy soul will be required. Tonight, you're going to die. Many today look at the uncertainty of the world in which we live. Living in fear. Because they don't know what's going to happen next nor where their future, what their future will hold. And folks, I, I'm just as guilty of 
that as perhaps many of you. I watch the world news. I see the events unfolding away and from our continent and our nation. Ultimately, ultimately, possibly leading to a worldwide, a worldwide war. I look at the economy. I look at the economy because ultimately, as we look at the cost of goods, the consumer price index is what now it costs you, and that's what they base the inflation rate on. You look at the consumer price index and the rate of inflation, and you think, well, you know, am I going to have enough to retire on? Am I going to have enough to live? Am I going to be able to get by? And we live a life of anxiety. Afraid. And then there are those who are living in the world and they think, well, you know what? If I can just gain one more thing, if I can just get one more thing, if I can just make one more dollar, then I'll have everything I need. I told one of my kids one time, I said, you know what? I'm not going to say which one it is. I said, you know what? They, they had big plans and they were looking ahead and they said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I told them, I said, you know what? I said, the, your problem is you have a Cadillac, a Cadillac appetite on a Chevy budget. You better consider those things that are most important. In the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Luke records Jesus' words for us. In verse 33, Jesus instructs those people, He says, Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, nor moth corrupteth. In Matthew chapter 6, a portion of the famous Sermon on the Mount, we know from Matthew chapter 5, it extends all the way to chapter 7 of Matthew. Jesus instructs his audience, he says, consider the fowl of there. In other words, look at the birds. They neither sow nor reap, but God provides for them. Consider the lilies, the flowers. And Solomon's temple in all of its glory was not clothed with the beauty that God gave or gives the flowers. Just a few verses down in verses 31 through 33, Jesus follows those illustrations with these words. He says, take no thought. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first, verse 33, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. What Jesus is saying and what Paul is repeating in 1 Timothy in chapter 6 and verse 6, is that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, if you look at that verse in the context to which it's written, Paul speaks to Timothy in the first few verses of that verse. And he, he, he's talking to servants and he's, uh, those who are under the yoke and how their relationship is to be with their master. And those who have believing masters, not to despise them, he tells us in verse 2. But when he comes to verse 5, he says, don't get involved. And all of these perverse arguments, in all the worldly thought, 
which holds no eternal truth. Which holds no eternal truth. Because Jesus doesn't want his people living a life of anxiety. We're instructed in God's Word to be anxious for nothing. So, how do we overcome that anxiety? Well, through God's grace, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through living a lifestyle exhibiting the character of holiness, being considered godly, then we find that contentment or sufficiency because the gain we have that causes us to be content, is found in Christ, in Christ alone. My friend, I ask you this morning, and I realize that I've covered a lot and much of it was Greek to you. But the truth of the matter is this is that apart from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no peace and there is no contentment. So I ask you this morning, where do you stand when it comes to the marathon? An old preacher once described walking through a cemetery and looking at each headstone. And on each headstone, it had a date of birth, and it had a date of death. I think I've even used this illustration in some funeral messages. But it's what happened between those dates that's important. Because that's the marathon, that's the course, that's the race that that person ran while they were on this earth. My hope and my prayer is, is that you've, you've considered the Christian life a marathon and that you're pressing toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus that you might receive the crown. The crown. The crown of righteousness. The crown of life. So that your name is written down in heaven. And your citizenship is changed. Last night there was a young lady that competed for the United States of America. Who recently changed her citizenship. so that she could represent the USA. They were interviewing this young lady and asking her what it meant to her to be able to compete on behalf of our country. And she went on and on and on about how thrilled she was to have a country that accepted her, who received her, and who encouraged her and supported her in her race. That sounds like the church to me. You see, the next step in becoming a believer is being a part of the local church. Maybe you're here this morning. and God is speaking to your heart. He's called you to Christ many years ago, or perhaps a few years ago, or maybe even today. And he's calling you to take part in the church so that you have 
fellow runners to run the race, which is very long. but with a goal in mind that they might encourage you and embrace you and receive you and yes and sometimes even rebuke you for the glory of God and the kingdom of heaven so that you continue to press towards that mark. To fight a good fight. To finish the course. That you might receive the prize. If that's you this morning. How will you respond? How will you respond? Christian. I'm going to just make it very short and sweet. Live a godly life. Find your contentment in Christ, which is your heavenly gain. And by living a godly life, practice holiness, not hypocrisy. Let's stand together this morning as our music team comes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the contentment that we find when we draw close to you. We find your peace and our self-satisfaction in you. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of gain. Not as the world looks for it. But Lord, as you've prepared for us, for all those who believe, on the name of your Son, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that though we're running in a marathon, you know the exact date that this old life will end. And eternity will begin. So, Lord, let us be found faithful and prepared. Let us be found ready to be offered up to you a glorious offering. In Jesus' name, amen.